11, 2005, with Mr. John Crane, a continuation of an interview started on March the 28th regarding his experience in World War II in the European theater. John, we're delighted to have you back to finish up this morning. Okay. Well, here are the odds and ends omitted from the first session due to my disorganization in my old age. And uh, as I just learned from you, I had said something in the first section, at least one session, uh, one part of it was a duplicate of what I'm planning to say now. So there will be some duplication. So these are the odds and ends. First item I would mention is I had, I believe, spoken of seven childhood friends in the neighborhood, five of whom were in the same circle of friends in this Jersey City, New Jersey neighborhood where I lived, and these five were within 400 feet of each other. I just wish to add to the comment that there were three years between the time of my high school graduation and entry into military service. Uh, for these other fellows, there was a four to six year period because uh, they were older. And uh, we were all high school graduates at that point in time without the prospect of a college education, except the minister's son who was in college and planned to be a divinity student following in his father's footsteps. The so-called GI Bill of Rights, uh, officially Public Law 346, gave great veteran benefits, enabling a change for five of us, but only two of us used the benefit to go on to college. Myself and uh, the Swede, Oscar Johnson. Incidentally, he and I spent the last pre-military year together. We worked in the same war plant nearby. We walked to work. That's WECO, Western Electric Elevator Company. They made electric elevators for the outside of the uh, prefab, the mass-produced uh, aircraft carriers that were used in World War II. And we shared the same bedroom. He had moved away from Jersey City for his senior year and graduated from a high school uh, in New York State. And uh, he had come back to the city now because uh, that's where high-paying war work was. And uh, he went to Westinghouse where I was. And my mother gave him a place to live without asking me whether or not I <laughs> wanted to do it or even telling me until he arrived. The second item, second odd and end, was uh, about, uh, in the first session I spoke of the, my time with the 20th Armored Division in Camp Campbell, Kentucky, but I left out a couple of memories that I will now relate. One was climbing a water tower for a good view of the grounds and be surprised to find that at the top of the ladder to the walkway around the base of the tank, around the bottom of the tank, not the base, I had a section of ladder that leaned backwards. So if you, so you had to be careful with how you handled your feet, otherwise you'd be hanging there by your hands. The second item was uh, about uh, that uh, time at the 20th Armored Division was when the famous utility vehicle called the Jeep reached the training camps and the 
the platoon sergeant of my tank battalion explained that they already had a jeep, that is, a vehicle that they called a jeep. So, he says, we'll have to call this one the peep. But, of course, that never happened because the power of the press is such that they'll name things what they want to name. <laughs> and the peep uh, became the jeep, and the jeep, I believe, became the command car. I'm not sure about that. The second item was the time that, uh, no, I'm sorry, there were only two items. Now I'm going to resume where I think I left off at the last week's recording session. It was not until late 1944 when I reached the front lines joining Company E of the 157th Infantry Regiment in the 45th Division of 7th Army, and that was at Rambervillers, France. Before anything really happened, that is combat, we were given a division rest, and so we retreated to the rear. The 45th Division consisted of the 157th Infantry Regiment, the 158th which was field artillery, and the 180th. And there were other kinds of units that were never explained to me, and which I never saw. However, I found out about one of them. It was the 84th, 82nd Airborne Division. They worked with the 45th Division, and I learned about that in 1990 from a man named Ford in Tucker, Georgia. The division rest was a resort in peacetime. His name was it uh, was at Martini Lavaines in France. And there were no customers for such a place in wartime, no food, no supplies, no personnel. So maybe the owners were glad to have uh, use made of it because I'm sure they got paid and maybe the Germans were there before us. I don't know. Anyway, I recall not liking the crowded conditions and smoking. At least 80% of the guys seemed to smoke. And so I looked around for something else and I found a big lobby sort of room with plush red velvet seats lining the walls. So that's where I stayed. I can't recall how long we were there, maybe a week, 10 days, I'm not sure. One memory of that place beside the red velvet seats that I used for sleeping was being on fire guard duty in the middle of the night, dark of course, no electricity, and uh, I was reading uh, Edgar Allan Poe by Candlelight. Later on, some weeks later, I don't remember how many, there was another rest of a few days where we were house-quartered at Valois, V-A-L-L-O-I-S, a tiny farm community in France. And uh, that's where I saw that agriculture in Europe still had some middle age elements to it. Everybody lived in a cluster. That was the town. And they went out to their fields surrounding the town to farm. Here and everywhere else I was at, uh, later on, all small towns, it was notable that there was no young people around. At Valois, one day, while standing around in formation, but at ease, uh, one morning, uh, on the sole dirt street of the town, an old farmer and a young boy came out with two farm animals and mated a bull and a cow in front of the formation. Being a city boy, that was new to me. In the house 
where I was quartered in that town, their outhouse, no plumbing, was too full to use, but the way it was built, uh, attached to a tiny barn, you open the kitchen door to go into the barn and you saw two rows of cows posteriors on each side of the walkway. At a house in another town, in another rest, we were too many to the room as usual. It was winter time on the second floor. And so, for my taste, I decided to go through an access door to a crawl space between the roof and the uh, living quarters to escape the crowd and the smoke. And on still another occasion, in another farmhouse, I slept in wire baskets of the barn area. Bar wire baskets used, uh, lined up against the wall, used for storing uh, fruits and vegetables. And uh, I liked that better than the mob scene on the floor. All of these rests or when our unit, a, a battalion, uh, was in reserve. As it was explained to me, at any given time, uh, a, a, a group of three battalions, there, there were two on the line and one in reserve to see where it would be needed if action was such that a reinforcement was needed. And the last rest that I remember was in Mary, Germany. That's a little town and there's nothing there in the little hamlet except a brewery where we were quartered. This was near the end of my active service, which ended on March 15th, 1945 when I was shot. Without any notification, I had earlier become a PFC and a corporal. I found out about these promotions by getting an increased amount of pay in a pay envelope. There was no other kind of communication. At this more lengthy rest in Merring, I was told I was promoted to sergeant. That's the lowest rank buck sergeant. And uh, I share a tiny room with the staff sergeant, who was the squad leader, the uh, buck sergeant, the assistant squad leader. And uh, the owner of this brewery was an old guy, I was told, and his young wife looked for something better, and Braden was the guy, the guy I shared room with. So he asked me to leave on occasions when she stopped in for servicing. There was never any news given to us in the, uh, at the company level or the platoon level, squad level, but I found out what was going on two ways. One was uh, there were two service newspapers which I once in a while got a copy of. I remember the Stars and Stripes was the name of the one. I don't remember the other. But mainly I found out because I subscribed to Newsweek and I got it in the mail. It was a condensed version, absolutely no ads. Now it was small in size. The point to be made is that there was no communication of casualties at any time, with the one sole exception. After the first day in combat, uh, several months earlier, word of mouth news was that Hood the VAR man had been killed. During my entire time in the 157s, we were in rural areas. One time we were in a bombed out factory in a small rural town, and we were told to drop our packs because we would come back and get them later. Well, we never did. My little notebook with names and addresses of 
to two dozen people was lost, so correspondence stopped except to home and my future wife, whose addresses I knew without the need of a book. There were several advantages to me of this rural duty of the battalion. The main one being, uh, I speculate, was that there was less risk to life and limb. With communications as uninformative as they were, not having heard of any casualties at any time, even in my own squad of 12 men, except for that one uh, I just mentioned, it must have been that there were casualties because on this rest of Mary, in my platoon of four squads, there were three promotions. Two staff sergeants to be squad leaders and one buck sergeant to be assistant squad leader. I couldn't complain about the lower rank. As I think I've said, I was not physically equipped for the role of combat infantryman. I knew that from basic training days, as well as over there in France and Germany, I knew that I was not par with the other guys uh, physically. In combat, uh, for only, I, although I was in combat for uh, only a few months until my March 15th bullet wounds, there was one occasion when we were moving at night through wooded hills, so dark that each man had to hold on one to the other, one in, to the guy in front of him, which made for slow going. Uh, however, that was not a problem. However, there was another time in daylight when I just couldn't keep up and I had to drop back. I didn't have to stop. I just had to slow down. And then when we finally stopped, uh, I had to continue until I reached my unit. So these other two guys who were made staff sergeant, Raiden and Carson, were strong men, bigger than me, which was not too hard to do since I weighed 145 pounds and was what you call small bone. Thus, as I said, uh, I couldn't complain about the promotion to buck sergeant instead of staff sergeant. These other men uh, were probably at the corporal level too. I don't know due to the lack of communications. I hadn't met them. Uh, previously. Uh, once we left the rest, we had no contact with anyone except the guy, guy or two on your left and right if you were advancing in a line, or the guys in front of you and in back of you if you were advancing in a column. If stopped long enough, like a few days, we dug two man foxholes and were spread out laterally. On such nights, we took two hour turns at sleeping and watching, that is, guarding the area in front of the foxhole. Supporting my theory that it was my personal good fortune to reach combat late in the war when the Germans had few resources left and to be put in a battalion that operated in rural areas where action was light and therefore casualties were light. Evidence to support that was a 50th anniversary 1995 tabulation uh, article, uh, tabulation printed in the VFW magazine. It was the 50th they were speaking of the 50th anniversary of the war. So it showed Army Division casualties in the European theater for 100 divisions. 
The 45th division was the sixth highest out of the 100, with 4,080 deaths and 14,441 casualties. The 20th Armored Division was 98th on the list, with 50, 59 deaths and 134 casualties. So if I had stayed with him, I would have been perhaps at even lower risk. The 13th Airborne Division, which I never heard of, was 100th on the list. They had no deaths and no casualties, so maybe they never reached action. Now well, here are some more memories, not organized in any fashion, nor in time sequence. During my second division arrest, <clears throat> there were only uh, there were only two of these division rests, the first one being right after I joined. Uh, in the second division rest, I got qualified for the grenade launcher, which is used with a standard issue M1 Grand Rifle, and qualified for the flame thrower. I never used either in combat, but I used the grenade launcher once in the exercises during the division rest. And I found, to my great surprise, that the grenade, which was the concussion type, not the fragmenting grenade that we carry around with us as standard issue, the grenade which I fired as a signal to start a certain phase of the exercises, it could go off rather unexpectedly and unintendedly close to you. And that's what happened to me. Apparently there was a little twig on a branch overhead in the trajectory of the grenade and I didn't notice it because it was too inconspicuous and not thought by me to be in the path of the grenade. I never saw it, the cause of the explosion but it was right in front of me and it was loud, and personally, I think it was probably one of the contributing factors to my mild hearing loss later in life. On one occasion, when I was point man of an advancing squad, I came to a house where a young wounded German soldier was, and he came running out to surrender speaking only in German, of course. He was very excited. I guess he has heard a lot and believed the propaganda about what the Americans do to the enemy and uh, had in mind that we were going to do something else besides take him prisoner. On another occasion, when we were in uh, the same position long enough to dig two-man foxholes, and alternate with the two-hour watches during the night, I set a flare booby trap a little ways out in front of the hole, and uh, I caught a prisoner that way. On uh, another patrol in the hill country, this was the item which I think I may have said before. I was point man on a patrol, uh, uh, advancing squad in the densely wooded hill country and I saw someone below, I threw the grenade, I doubt if it reached them and I'm glad it didn't because I later found out it was one of us. And that's the way communications were. I had no idea that another GI could be in the area where we were going into. On another patrol I was in charge and an event occurred which I later realized was very significant. As we approached a river, I saw a few German soldiers coming down the barren slope on the other side. The slope that we were on was wooded. They were coming down to get water from the river. I gave orders 
for an ambush to commence firing when I started the fire. And that's when the impossible happened, the impossible that I think I spoke of in the previous session of the Garand rifle being uh, foolproof and the trigger mechanism uh, is perfectly dependable because my trigger jammed, I could not fire the rifle. Uh, so I had to order the other guys to start. Many years later, in combination with some other things in my life, uh, not uh, related here in these uh, uh, memories, I realized that I uh, did not have God's permission to commit murder, even though the chaplains and everybody else said it was okay. The incident with the grenade I threw toward a fellow soldier, because I never had 2020 vision in the field, uh, was uh, showed my dependence on uh, eyeglasses. Uh, eyeglasses, uh, theoretically, they give you 2020, but when you're out in the field and uh, Physical conditions are not optimum. You don't have 20-20. I could have recognized the shape of the guy's helmet, uh, the guy I threw a grenade against, or the color of his uniform, if I had good vision. But I was just assuming that there was no one else out there ahead of me, and never thought of the possibility of someone, another squad, advancing parallel to me and then possibly coming from me in the opposite direction, as this fellow was at the bottom of the hill, in the opposite direction to where I was going in the top of the hill. It's easy to get disorganized in wooded hills. We did not have compasses. So I was more cautious after that, and when we were advancing slowly on March 15th, at, and I was at rest, at one point in time, uh, I saw a movement a couple hundred yards ahead in the wooded area. I did not fire or order firing or tell anyone ahead of me, password ahead. The assistant squad leaders last, so I, uh, and we, we were probably in a lateral line, I, I don't know. But anyway, I was uh, semi-exposed and not feeling at risk, so I was not particularly trying to uh, hide myself. I was sort of crouching with the rifle resting on my right side uh, uh, as a sort of uh, in the crouch position and uh, awaiting orders to, for it to move ahead, and that's when I got shot. The bullet entered midway up my the inside of my right arm and exited about three inches further, and then back into the arm at the elbow and exiting at the opposite end of the bent elbow. If it were further to the left by about six inches, it would have hit my heart and I wouldn't be here now giving a personal oral history. The bureaucracy was such in the, the Army that uh, I didn't get out of the hospital and back to Company F until after VE Day, which was in May. Again, they had no room for me in the unit I was in, which was Company F. So. Uh, we were quartered in Munich, Germany, so I was put in with some other fellows. Uh, I don't even know who they were. Uh, we never had any social activity or lineups or anything. Uh, it, it was uh, everybody on his own without uh, having to account to anybody except to be there. Uh, we were all in a small apartment 
where older stuff was stored in a closet and looted by us. I didn't feel that stealing was justified, but I took a metal cigar box anyway, and uh, I use it to this day. We were shipped out through camps named after cigarette companies. I would have to look up my correspondence to my parents, which is now stored in my cellar, to find out which one it was. Everyone got free cigarettes in those days, and 80% of the guys, I estimate, uh, smoked. They, the cigarettes were rationed after the war, and I, being a non-smoker, sold my allotment on the active black market. That supplemented my regular pay. Actually, I don't remember what the regular pay. The regular pay was for a private was thirty dollars a month, and for combat, private is sixty dollars a month. I don't know what I got as sergeant. I don't recall. But anyway. I utilized a little used service of the Army, a savings account. And so I put my little black market money in there. And I had accumulated, as, as well as my pay, because I wasn't spending money on anything. <laughs> uh, the way you guys uh, usually did it, well, we were not in a place where you could go anywhere. Uh, during, in these deparkation camps, uh, uh, there was nothing to do except uh, gamble, and uh, I wasn't a gambler. And during combat, there was even less uh, opportunity to do anything, so uh, basically I had nothing to do with the money, uh, so I put it in a savings account. I accumulated $1,100 by the time I was discharged. I remember part of the $1,100 came another way. While well, stationed in Munich and doing guard duty as a private. I did that for guys, for privates, who uh, would rather do something else in Munich and pay a dollar an hour. So that's when I picked up a few bucks on guard duty. Some guard duty was in a museum, unlighted of course, and at night, all night with orange suits standing around among the objects on display. It was, you know, a little, you might say, scary. Uh, and such guard duty uh, was not done in Iraq, as we all know. Another memory was at the other end of my overseas duty when going into uh, to join the 157s, we go through Rebel Depot, which is the nickname for the replacement depot. And we were being moved there in the European box cars, such as my father used in uh, World War I, when he was a corporal in the field artillery of the Occupation Army. The uh, freight cars are called 40 and 8s because they used them for 40 men and 8 horses in the same box car. How do you like to be on the floor next to a horse sleeping? <laughs> Forty men. I don't imagine they really laid down. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that was uh, the. Uh, oh, I, I, meant, I wanted to mention a side issue, and this brings up the, uh, the paper that I forgot, which I would like to have recorded here. Uh, <clears throat> there was after the war a apparently spontaneous movement in the French population. They donated all kinds of things to uh, the U.S. Army. 
and uh, a train and 50 of these 48 box cars. It was called the Gratitude Train, and I learned about this uh, just uh, oh, uh, 2004. I had never heard of it before, but I got an association newsletter at that time, uh, and it mentioned it has this article about the gratitude train. Every state got one of them. Some of them, of course, nobody knows where some of them are. George's boxcar, unannounced that I have ever seen, and is on Avondale Avenue in southeast Atlanta. I'm going to go there someday. <clears throat> Next in this semi-organized history, I'm going back to the October-November period when I arrived from the U.S. The Queen Mary left us in Ireland, I believe, but uh, after we crossed the channel and were being moved, uh, moved across the channel, uh, we were moved on the famous and amazing, to me, the 4x4 trucks. Uh, I clearly remember two things about the trip. One was truck drivers, when we stopped for the night, this is cold weather, they took a five gallon can, a so called jerry can, of gasoline, laid it flat on the ground, took the truck's fire axe, and put a couple of slots in it, and lit it. The only fire, the fire lasted only a few minutes providing a few minutes heat, and then they take another. And this was while the folks at home enjoyed rationing. I saw no officer in charge do anything about this great waste. And the second item that I wanted to mention was, uh, was uh, not on a trip, but uh, or during the rest, a rest, but it was on an overnight stop when we were moving by foot, and the squad was in a farm place, farm house area, or I guess, uh, and uh, the squad commandeered a small vacant cabin. I suppose it was a hunting cabin, and uh, so. Uh, some of the guys build a fire right in the middle of the floor. I can't remember how the smoke got out because maybe the roof was already off. I don't know. But uh, <clears throat> uh, the point to be made was that uh, the guys doing this to warm themselves, were doing this uh, to warm themselves by the fire until it burned through and fell to the ground. Mm -hmm. They couldn't do it anymore, and I suppose uh, that the owner uh, then had uh, a bigger repair job to do than he would have had had not the fire been built. This was in France, where the French were our allies. Now we're going back to memories from Brest. This one from the rest in the rear echelon. It was a standard practice for a soldier who wears eyeglasses to have two pairs. And for me, that was very important because I was 2020, I was the best vision I could have without eyeglasses. I can't recall how it was that I came to have only one pair. Quite possible that it was when I lost my backpack in the factory and therefore lost my second pair of glasses. But anyway, that's what I had, one pair, so I used the rest to request the restoration of the second pair. And the Army bureaucracy being what it is, I was sent back to the rear to a hospital. And they took so long that when I got back, the arrest was over, and I wasn't needed in Company E. I was assigned to Company F, where I finished my tour. 
Now here I will speak of a, a few miscellaneous memories from various overseas places at various times. One was being in this 48 boxcar on the way to Rambler Villas, sitting in the boxcar's open sliding door with my legs dangling over the edge as we went over a deep ravine and, and thinking how horrified my mother would be if she could see her little boy in that position. Another was learning that getting wet feet does not cause you to catch cold, as I had been taught, nor being in a draft, and learning that you do not have to get a bath or even wash your face for weeks at a time. And uh, you don't suffer any physical harm because of it. Uh, a fourth memory is being told by word of mouth that a guy named Slade had been sent back because he was so fearful that he cried and held his rifle overhead from the foxhole, pointed toward the enemy, when ordered to give cover fire. Another memory was of a guy who went AWOL more than once, but was always taken back without any punishment, so far as I knew. I don't know all the facts of the case, of course, what happened after the war or you know, any, even later on uh, while we were still in combat. Another Memory was going to Paris on a pass after VE Day and seeing, going to see the renowned Folly Berger and being startled to find female attendants in the men's room. Another surprise was finding that the latrines in French factories, such as the replacement depot we were in, the latrines were holes in the floor. And another memory was being seeing a, the uh, being on that troop transport called the Landgivy Castle and finding that the beds in the hold were stacked eight high. That is, you know, they were all hung on posts eight high. That was a short trip, of course we didn't use them. And uh, Another memory was on the trip back buying uh, an, an unidentified 38 caliber semi-automatic pistol. And I got that from a soldier who had more loot than he wanted to keep and was willing to accept $10 for the gun, so he sold it to me. Besides the cigar box I mentioned earlier in this gun, my souvenirs included these other few things. A box of 20 bullets ranging from 22 to 50 caliber. I think about half of them are German. Two of them I know are German. And it shows how bad off they were by the end of the war when I picked up these rounds of ammunition. These two rounds had wooden heads. Possibly that's what they gave the home guard. I also have halazin tablets. That's H-A-L-A-Z-O-N-E. Two bottles of 50 and one of 12. That's for purifying water when you don't have access to uh, drinking water in the field. I only clearly remember using them once in a forest where I dug a hole deep enough to get the canteen in after it had filled up with groundwater. I also have a chain that German soldiers use for cleaning the rifle bore. We didn't use anything, but in basic training we had used rods. 
course, you wouldn't use a rod in combat. So I never saw any uh, rod overseas. I also have a 11 inch by 5 inch green steel cylinder. That was the Germans' gas mask holder. Gas masks were another thing that I never saw overseas. By 1944, we knew there was nothing to fear from chemical attack, so we didn't carry them. The shoulder strap on this uh, is mostly missing, broken off. In that container, I have a swastika banner that's 27 inches by 51 inches. And I have two flashlights. They are oblong German single flashlights, where you put different colors in front of the bulb to make your signals. I didn't have, uh, they didn't have uh, radios. And the ninth and penultimate of these miscellaneous memories that I'll mention concerns a soldier from Michigan who is now in Florida. His name is Roy Holmstrom. I met him only briefly in a Repel Devil, where we were both on our way back to our 157th units. I don't remember what he had been in the hospital for. Uh, I was there to get the second pair of eyeglasses. In 1997, 53 years after we met, I found his name on a roster of 1,346 soldiers of the 157th Infantry Regiment, which was a uh, roster published by the 157th. All the other guys I knew apparently never bothered to find out about the existence of this uh, alumni association. and. Uh, I never found out about it until quite late. Uh, I was probably only about 10 or 15 years ago that I found out about it. Uh, he occasionally, we occasionally uh, exchanged letters. He didn't get taken out of action uh, by being wounded as I was, but he got a battlefield commission as a second lieutenant. Incidentally, the 45th Division has an association under that name, but I think that only the 180th Infantry Regiment is <laughs> the main component of that association. My tenth and final miscellaneous memory goes back to the very first day of combat, December 44th. As mentioned, December in 44, as mentioned, I believe I took part in basic training, some basic training three times. And the one thing that I learned in basic training is that you don't advance in a skirmish line in front of a machine gun. That's in case you didn't have enough common sense to figure that out. The irony is, that's exactly what we did the first day of combat and suffered the only platoon fatality that I knew about before I mentioned VA Army and Hood. So, now we reach the closing comment. Since my retirement from paid employment, at the end of 1984, I have spent about one day a week writing a book. Unlike any other book ever written, it will not be a storybook or a textbook. It will have no commercial market, but it will be the basis for a revolution. Whereas Martin Luther caused the revolution of the Roman Catholic Church, this book will be the basis for, not the cause of, a much larger revolution, that of Christianity. 
I do not expect this to happen in my lifetime. That is the revolution. I do expect to finish the book. <laughs> and since uh, I like anonymity, I'm glad that it will almost certainly be after my lifetime that there will be a uh, big fuss about it. I expect that it, uh, it will be put to minor use up to that time. A full explanation of the basis for making this prophecy would likely fill another tape, so it will not be done now, and that's it. John, what, were you scared when you first found, saw combat? <laughs> no, I had already philosophically resolved. Uh, no. I mean, as a Christian, which you seem to be overlooked nowadays, but what's to be afraid of? You're supposed to go somewhere better, right? So my only fear was becoming like a paraplegic or, <laughs> you know, being injured. And I certainly didn't like the prospect of pain. I wouldn't like to suffer. But so far as dying goes, that didn't bother me. When you got shot, yeah. were you scared? Did you think you'd been killed? No. Or did it hurt? Or? I knew I was hurt. Oh, incidentally, that uh, it's worth mentioning uh, what it feels like. Uh, it was a burn, a burning sensation. It was not another kind of pain. The pain was just like a burn. So. Uh, I didn't have anything to do, and after a while, you know, a medic got there, and he gave me morphine, and so uh, it was not a great problem. I had a much greater pain problem in the hospital, because when they sewed up, uh, well, we still got time here, huh? Yeah, yeah. three or four minutes. The bullet went in here, out here. Just a minute. Show this again. In here, out here, the sc uh, scars are pretty well healed. In here and out here. Okay. So when uh, this was done, they ripped open the, the, there was a hole here and a hole here, and they cut uh, the whole thing open. Okay. But they didn't heal, they didn't perfectly clean it, and I had an infection. So this is all in a big cast, and in a week after this operation to sew it up, it was really painful. Much worse than the hurt <laughs> of, of getting shot. I remember that very well. But you felt the evacuation of you to the back echelon areas was quick and expeditious. And well, it, you know, it was, it was all right, yeah. I didn't have to wait around very long. Mm -hmm. And if I was in tough shape, maybe I would, <laughs> would have been chasing, but you know, it was reasonably efficient, I'd say. Do you think the experience in World War II made you humble, appreciative, determined? Well, It taught me, I guess the main thing it taught me was that uh, I already knew that I was insignificant and therefore never very aggressive in promoting myself or doing things. Uh, for instance, Taking initiative uh, in oh, almost anything, I was not high on that sort of thing. And I wondered how these men in command, you know, officers, generals, knew how they figured out how to do what they're doing. And I later realized that. 
they often don't know what they're doing. <laughs> and uh, that caused me to, and then I realized the same thing applies in the business world that I went into. Some of the captains of industry are not as in command of the situation as they think they are. And they don't know as much as they do think they knew, they know. And uh, so I don't make that kind of mistake anymore. But I, I'm still conservative. I know how ignorant I am, and I don't uh, attempt to do things that are beyond my capability. Well, I would like to take issue with one thing you said. Yeah? You're not insignificant. Well, you you're know, very significant. In, in regards to uh, <laughs> the whole picture and other people, you know. But World War II was won, won by insignificant people yeah. playing, fulfilling their role and living up to their destiny yeah, and becoming right. significant. It was a collective yeah. action of all of you together that yeah. made it possible for people like me to finish you remember I, school. I remember the, I spoke of the ASTP program. Mm -hmm. And uh, recently there was a, I read a book review, uh, I don't have a note here now, uh, about this man who wrote the book, and my memory is so far gone I can't remember the title or the author, and it was about some extraordinary action taken in the Battle of the Bulge by this one platoon who was composed mainly of ASTP guys. Yeah. Well, I would like to express my personal appreciation to you for the role you played in making it possible for me to grow up here in mm -hmm. Northwest Atlanta. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm very much looking forward to being your neighbor in a few more months when we finish renovating the house. Yeah, I'm, sure I'm looking forward fun. to that too. Yeah. And on behalf of my generation and future generations, I want to offer my personal heartfelt thanks to you. Well, I thank you very much. And